Hello, I'm Mike McCall. I work for the ITC in the Netherlands, which is an international trading institute. Uh, we are working with all kinds of spatial information, geo-information. Uh, we're working with uh, the geo-information uh, associated with rural development and natural resource management in developing countries. All our people we work with, our students and so on, are coming from the developing countries, coming from South countries, Asia, Africa and, and uh, Latin America. Uh, we've been working with geo-information for a long time, but mostly from a remote sense. We're using satellite imagery, we're using air photography, we're using very formal methods of mapping and geo-information systems, GIS. Now we're working also at a much more local level. We're working with communities, we're working um, participation with the communities and other people are involved in the map making and in the interpretation of the Geo information. So now that you're working with your with communities, local communities, in your view, what is the demand in terms of capacity building in the practice of PGS? Uh, interesting question, <laughs> because it's not easy to to determine really what the demand is. Uh, we can't go village to village asking if people who would like to do this. But what we are receiving, and what we're very sure of, is that there is a, a lot of demand from intermediary organisations. They can be community or, or multiplicities of communities, com community groupings, uh, small NGOs, as well as the more national and international NGOs, and also academic institutions which are working in this area or, or concerned people who are working in that area. There's, there's a lot of demand because there's a lot of different reasons why PGS can be used for the community. The, some, of, some of it is to do with... Um, making claims, looking for land rights and resource rights. But there's also more broader than that is for natural resource management of those areas, people trying to manage and look after their own resources. Uh, sometimes what the, the need is for mapping to do with conflict between one community and another, or between the community and higher level institutions, the government or private sector where big forest companies are coming in or big ranching companies are coming in. Um, and, and at a deeper level, people, a lot of communities are seeing the possibility that the mapping is representing themselves, mm -hmm. representing their, their history and their culture. We see this particularly with indigenous peoples, but not only with that, but also with other neighborhoods, urban neighborhoods as well as, as, well as rural ones. Mm. And arising from this conference, um, there seems to be a lot of potential in terms of the demand being very high. How are you likely to meet that demand as it is? <laughs> We would be happy to meet a lot more of a demand, um, but we have some limitation in our, our, our capacity. But for, ex for example, here in Kenya, we've just run a two-week program together with a, with a, a Kenyan partner uh, called Emes, and that's the direction to go for my institute, ITC, working with key partners in various countries. We're working sim similar work in West Africa, in Mexico, in India, in Nepal, in Tanzania, and so on, Southern, Southern Africa where there are NGOs or consultancy companies or, or people who have the, some similar expertise and experience. And the way forward is more and more of these partnerships. I should like to say the reason why the training can go further is because the materials available are developing quite fast, just at the level of training materials, booklets, handbooks, and so on. More of them are coming out and the level of the technology which is needed. PGIS uses hardware and it uses software. Mm. And that's becoming more user-friendly, more available, more mobile, uh, more reliable. And that means, the, of course, not only the use continues with it, the real use by the communities, but actually it makes it easier for training as well. Yeah. And um, during this conference, what uh, have you picked up that uh, you can see is of value particularly to some of the people that you've trained mm -hmm. and even the potential organizations that are likely to benefit from PGIS mm -hmm. who are only gaining that awareness through this conference? Mm -hmm. yeah. I think a, a, a particular item which has come out, a benefit which has come out of this particular conference is cross-fertilization between different cultures. People have been coming from many communities and many, many areas around the world. 
um, especially from Southeast Asia, from Africa, and from North America. And there's amazing cross-fertilization between these groups because they have their own special knowledge and special experience. In, land, in, in community management of resources, in making land claims, um, in, in handling um, conflicts between communities. This cross-fertilization is important for those people, but, but we feel it's also very important for the training which we are doing, all training which should be done. But the training is not just in the technical aspects of how to use the machinery, but in the application of it, the, the difficulties with it, the problems with it, um, following it through, because PGIS, must emphasize, PGIS is part of participatory development of people. So, that is partly, or uh, that is mainly necessarily for the workshop, mm -hmm. but in as far as PGIS is concerned, because most of the time when you come from a conference, there are very high expectations. It's also in, important to anticipate some problems ahead. Yeah, yes. Yeah. There are problems with it. There are problems with all participatory techniques. And the first problem I would always ask, the first <coughs> controversy I would always ask is, who is participating? It's absolutely impossible for everybody to participate. And someone is representing, someone participates is representing other people. And that, that can never be 100% perfect. The second thing is because PGIS is bringing out new information which wasn't in the public domain before. It was private or it was community. There's benefits to that because it's generating new knowledge which people didn't even know they had and there are potential drawbacks. So we can't deny there are some, some problems with it. One is the information which is coming out. It's a wonderful thing to share information, to make information more public. But there's some information which people are, communities or individuals within are, not, are reluctant, are not so keen to have out. It can be information about resources which we're afraid that other outside groups, outside powerful groups, will try to exploit, to make use of. There's information about areas which, or places which are very important to them culturally, maybe sacred areas, or, um, or historical cultural areas. Some of that information they don't want the general public to know. Maybe individuals outside, but not, not to be generally available. So we have to also make use of some protocols or some methods by which some information is allowed out and others not. And of course, of course, the key to that is that the control of what comes in and what goes out mm -hmm. remains with the community or the best possible representatives of the community.